dear students so welcome to another lecture of wireless communication so in the last video lecture we were talking about uh, the different impairments uh, in a wireless channel so we talked about the thermal noise and about signal to noise ratio uh, etc so in this lecture we will start with the other impairments that you can have for a wireless communication system so <clears throat> so we can have uh, other than the thermal noise we can have uh, atmospheric impairments uh, or atmospheric absorptions so this is because of the water vapor and the moisture and other particles that are in the atmosphere that contribute to attenuation then uh, the most important impairment in any wireless channel is the multipath and this is because you have different obstacles that are reflecting the signals and you get multiple copies of the same signal at the receiver with varying delays and also with varying amplitudes and then there is a refraction uh, which which is uh, the bending of the radio waves as they propagate through the atmosphere so this also adds to the impairments in a wireless channel so let's uh, let's look into the effect of multipath closely so basically this is caused by reflection diffraction and scattering in the atmosphere and because of these uh, phenomena multiple copies of the signal may arrive at different phases okay so <clears throat> if the phases add destructively the signal level relative to noise declines making the detection more difficult okay so so this is a this is a this is a serious problem for any wireless channel and because the signals uh, arrive at the receiver after getting reflected refracted uh, scattered uh, the the multiple paths that the signal follow okay as the name suggests multipath uh, because of their different path lengths the phase of the signal will be different okay so and that uh, that is totally random in nature like how many copies of the signal arrive at the receiver and what are their path lengths these things are totally random in nature and at a given instant of time the phases of the different multiple copies of the signal uh, can add together in a constructive manner or may cancel each other out okay so <clears throat> so that is the that is the problem okay so in that case you can have a very low quality signal okay so an example is let's say you have a sine wave okay like this okay so this is this is a sine wave and then uh, let's say a 180 degree um, a 180 degree phase shifted version of this wave could be like this okay so here it is positive and here it is exactly negative of this so when you add these two together these two signals totally cancel each other and now depending on any other intermediate phases let's say like this the total signal uh, can be um, can be low compared to let's say the original signal which is this one okay so this is the problem uh, that multipath uh, phenomenon uh, have okay so this phase of the signals they can add destructively and then there are uh, inter-symbol interferences so because of this multipath 
there could be inter symbol interference so one or more delayed copies of a pulse may arrive at the same time as the primary pulse okay uh, so that that can be a problem and then there could be rapid signal fluctuations uh, because of this multipath because as I said many signals come together and depending on what delay they have between each other uh, the, the amplitude of the resultant signal in the receiver that is the sum of all these delayed components they can have very rapidly fluctuating uh, amplitudes so this is the scenario so you, you see that in case of uh, wireless communication you have a line of sight but then you have a reflected copy and a refracted copy reaching together at this receiving antenna okay uh, in case of your mobile phones also let's say you are receiving a signal directly from this base station but then other copies of the signal are getting you know reflected from different obstacles and then you are receiving all of them together so if you add all of this depending on this path lengths okay the phases of these two reflected copies will be different and all of them added together may you know lower down the amplitude of the resultant signal and that is the main problem that we have due to multipath uh, again this slide basically shows uh, the different um, components okay uh, of, a, of a received signal so you see this R is the reflected component is getting reflected here then let's say there is a lamp post here and and the signal gets scattered so this is denoted by S from the corner of a building there could be a diffraction which is denoted as D and then you can have another ref reflection here so another r here so so these are the different phenomena uh, that that occurs that that contribute to the effect of multipath so uh, we were talking about the inter symbol interference so this uh, slide captures that nicely so you have let's say a transmitted pulse here and then after a certain time duration you have another transmitted pulse okay so these transmitted pulses let's say are your information carrying pulses okay now uh, you, you receive the same pulse almost similar looking pulse because of line of sight so you have this original pulse that you have received maybe there is there is a attenuation so the amplitude of this received pulse is a bit less than the transmitted pulse okay but then there are different multipaths so the same pulse let's say this one uh, is getting received uh, at the receiver by line of sight and then the other thing other pulses also are received which are reflected and refracted or diffracted or scattered you know pulses so these are the copies okay so these are the different copies of the original signal that are getting received because of the multipath okay so now see one of the copies here is getting on top of the next received pulse which is because of this transmitted pulse okay so this phenomenon this this overlap of a multipath copy with an original pulse is called inter symbol interference so this is called inter symbol interference or isi and this is a problem okay and we have to mitigate that problem so well, let's talk about multipath fading so the term fading is is actually a combined term 
that is given to this time variation of the received signal power caused by the effect of multipath okay so <clears throat> so there could be many reasons of fading let's say in a fixed environment when you are not moving so fading is affected by changes in atmospheric conditions such as rainfall uh, in case of a mobile environment where one of the two antennas is moving relative to the other then uh, the relative location of various obstacles also changes over time okay and this creates a complex transmission effect so let's say let's say your antenna your base station is here okay and you are in a car okay with your mobile phone and as the car moves okay if the car is here then then your channel between your transmitter and receiver is this okay whatever is this now if the car moves to a location here okay then the channel changes now the channel is this one okay so depending on how far is the car or what is the relative position of the car from the base station the channel changes so there might be a line of sight in this original position a now in this position b there could be a tree in between okay and and there would be and because of the because of this tree or because of this obstacle there would be some absorption of the signal okay or some reflection or whatever and and the effect of the multipath changes totally so this case b will have more fading than case a okay so the general term uh, of signal fluctuations because of all this effect of multipath uh, is called fading and you can have different types of fading okay you can have large scale fading you can have small scale fading large scale scale fading is basically the path loss when you move farther away from your transmitter your signal gets attenuated so that is path loss you can have shadowing effect so if you are if you and your um your base station uh, is, is separated by some big obstacles in between then there is a shadowing effect uh, in terms of small scale fading you can have multipath delay spread and doppler spread okay so doppler spread is purely related to the mobile environment so when you are moving and depending on the speed of your movement whether you are walking or whether you are in a car you will have uh, Doppler spread and you can have fast fading and slow fading within within Doppler spread mm -hmm. on the case of multipath delay spread you can have again flat fading and frequency selective fading okay so and then there are different conditions that actually lead to this type of fading so let's say in case of your multipath delay spread and and under that uh, flat fading the condition is that your signal bandwidth should be much much less than your channel bandwidth okay for frequency selective fading your signal bandwidth has to be greater than the channel bandwidth again for case for the case of doppler spread and fast fading under doppler spread your symbol period should be more than the coherence time and then in case of slow fading under doppler spread your symbol period should be much much less than the coherence time okay so we will explain later in this lecture what is coherence time uh, and, 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 and and how that is affecting your fading okay so this is again uh, an example of you know uh, slow versus fast fading so this blue line shows um, gradually you know decreasing amplitude of of the signal with respect to position so this is kind of slow fading 
on top of that there are rapid fluctuations so these are these are fast fading okay <clears throat> so let's let's talk about the types of fading into a little more detail so uh, you have large scale fading where the signal variations are over large distances uh, so this is this is path loss which is an example of large scale fading we have we have studied that already then we have shadowing which is also an example of large scale fading and then this this type of fadings uh, can be statistically modeled using uh, different techniques like Rayleigh and Ricean fading so so these are basically different statistical you know distributions that model the 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 randomness of this type of fading okay so uh, we won't discuss the details of this they are beyond the scope of this module so just for your information there are two types of fading uh, models Rayleigh and Ricean so uh, so Doppler spread is one of the types of fading where uh, because of the movement of the of the transmitter relative to the receiver you experience this type of uh, fading so we were talking about coherence time so basically we coherence time tc uh, this is the time that a channel remains the same okay so this is basically the time over which the channel remains the same and this characterizes Doppler shift so if your color coherence time TC which is purely the characteristic of the channel and is given by the time that a channel remains same doesn't change if that time is much much larger than TB which is the bit time of your signal then you experience slow fading so this means that the channel does not change during the bit time okay if this condition is not met then we have fast fading so let's say if your tc or coherence time is 70 milliseconds and your bit rate is 100 kilobit uh, per second okay then uh, your bit time is basically 10 microsecond okay so now the question is is 70 millisecond much much larger than 10 microsecond the answer is yes okay because 70 millisecond is 70 into 10 minus 3 uh, this is obviously much much greater than 10 microsecond which is this so therefore this is an example of slow fading okay <clears throat> so in case of your um, multipath delay spread or multipath fading uh, so multiple signals arrive at the receiver and this type of fading is characterized by your coherence bandwidth so notice in case of doppler spread you are uh, you are comparing uh, the signal and the channel in time domain so you had defined tc or coherence time in case of multipath fading you are you are characterizing your channel and the signal in the frequency domain so you are working with the bandwidth so this is the bandwidth over which the channel response remains relatively constant so this is the coherence bandwidth now uh, if your signal bandwidth BS is 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 um, much much less than BC, then you have flat fading. This means that the signal bandwidth fits well within the channel bandwidth. If this condition is not met, then we have frequency selective fading. So let's say my coherence bandwidth is 150 kilohertz and my bit rate is 100 kilobit per second. So if I assume that the signal bandwidth is almost of the order of the bit rate, then we will roughly have 
a hundred kilohertz bandwidth of the signal okay so <clears throat> so if you have a hundred kilohertz bandwidth then is bc which is 150 kilohertz much much greater than bs uh, so 150 kilohertz is it much much greater than 100 kilohertz probably not because to use this much much greater sign it has to be uh, a factor of 10 higher okay so 150 kilohertz is not more than let's say 10 times of 100 kilohertz these two are almost comparable values so therefore this condition is not met and therefore we have frequency selective fading so this slide kind of uh, visually shows you what's the scenario so let's say you have a signal spectrum like this okay and then you have a flat fading channel so your your signal spectrum is within minus b and plus b okay so you see the channel bandwidth which is which is much much larger than your signal bandwidth and also the channel remains flat so the coherence bandwidth of the channel is bc is the bandwidth over which the channel is flat right so this is your this is your coherence bandwidth this bandwidth is coherence bandwidth and over this the channel is relatively flat okay so this bc if it is much much greater than this channel bandwidth uh, sorry the signal bandwidth then you have flat fading and that is what you are having here but let's say if your coherence bandwidth let's say in this example this is a frequency selective channel and this channel is fluctuating a lot within the signal bandwidth so basically in this case your bc is less than bs okay and therefore you have a frequency selective uh, output from the channel and you have frequency selective fading okay so so this is flat fading and this is frequency selective fading <clears throat> so because of this fading you you can have you know your bit error rate which is uh, the function of this uh, eb by n0 so we saw in the last video lecture that how the bit error rate was falling down as we increased eb by n0 so this was the case only when we had thermal noise okay so now if you just factor in the effect of fading then you can have different types of curves so let's say this one is the curve for for flat fading and slow fading Rayleigh limit so again you saw a few slides back that you model the fading statistics using Rayleigh and Ricean distribution so if you have Rayleigh fading then you have some type of EB by N0 versus B or plot if you have Ricean with K equal to 4 then you have a better performance okay if you recall uh, the curves that was uh, shown in the last class you see this the more steep the curves are better performance is indicated so here <coughs> you, if you have Ricean fading with uh, k equal to 4 so k is the parameter of the Ricean distribution you have a better performance if you increase k you have again further improvement in your performance and then this is the additive white Gaussian noise model so this is the case same as this one that we saw in the last class where we were just plotting BER in the presence of thermal noise or additive white Gaussian noise okay now if you have fading 
then the performance obviously degrades so you have a worse curve and then that fading depending on different types of fading the curves get even worse okay as you move this direction and this is the worst possible curve so this is for frequency selective fading or fast fading so see frequency selective fading is not very good you you are getting a curve which is which is which is having a very high probability of error okay and it's almost flat with respect to your signal to noise ratio so this is this is bad this is worst actually so let's do a class exercise um, let's say we have a multipath fading channel and that has a multipath spread of tm equal to one second and a doppler spread bd equal to 0 0.01 hertz the total channel bandwidth at band pass available for signal transmission is this okay so to reduce the effects of intersymbol interference the signal designer selects a pulse duration of 10 seconds determine the coherence bandwidth and the coherence time is the channel frequency selecting explain is the channel fading slowly or rapidly explain okay so let's see so so here some of the uh, some of the symbols uh, or notations are different uh, because I picked up this problem from a different uh, book okay but I will explain uh, what are these relative to what you just learned so let's say <coughs> you have TM which is one second so this is the this is the multipath spread okay so basically your coherence bandwidth okay which is denoted as delta fc here so this is equivalent to bc that you just learned okay so this is roughly equal to 1 over tm 1 over the multipath spread and therefore this is 1 hertz your bd which is 0 0.01 hertz uh, that gives you uh, basically the coherence time so this is this is your coherence time okay this is 1 over bd or 1 over the doppler spread and that is 100 seconds okay so now uh, your w or the total signals transmission bandwidth is 5 hertz okay so you, all you have to do is to compare this value of w with your coherent bandwidth okay which is 1 hertz so this 5 hertz is is much much greater than 1 hertz like 5 times okay so therefore the channel is frequency selective and since your pulse duration t which is 10 second is less than your coherence time which is 100 second the channel is slowly fading let's do another exercise so this is an example of a three ray multipath okay so let me first draw this okay so let's say you have uh, you have your antenna transmitter antenna here the base station okay and let's say your mobile phone is here okay so <clears throat> this is a three ray multipath so basically let's say i have a direct line of sight and let's say i have one reflected copy okay and let's say here is a building okay and i have a reflection from this building so th there are three rays okay one two and three that are reaching your receiver so this is a example of a three ray multipath so consider a 980 megahertz signal um, experiencing a three ray multipath the transmitted signal st um, and the received signal is this so basically you have st which is which you are transmitting and the received signal so let's say the line of sight component is 
a0 times st so this one this one is a0 times st okay and then the other two reflected copies let's say this one is a1 times s of t minus tau 1 so this signal will have some delay due to the longer path which is denoted as tau 1 and the amplitude or the attenuation will be different so this is denoted by a1 and then let's say i have the third multipath component which is a2 times s of t minus tau 2 so again this signal because of the different path length is experiencing a delay of tau 2 and and, uh, and, and attenuation that is denoted by this amplitude a2 so let's say we have given all these values so a0 is 0 0.4 a1 is 1, A2 is 0.7 and then tau1 is these many microsecond and tau2 is these many microsecond. So what is the distance in meters between the longest and the shortest path? Okay. So, so let's say, let's say this is the shortest path. Okay. This is the direct line of sight and let's imagine that this one is the longest. Okay. In fact, the path for which this tau is maximum that is the longest path because the length of the path and the amount of delay is proportional the longer you go the more time it takes to receive okay so tau 2 is the highest here so this is your longest path okay so the amount of delay between the longest and the shortest path is tau 2 because the shortest path has zero delay and the longest has tau 2 so the amount of delay is tau 2 which is these many microseconds and the distance in meters can be calculated from this information okay so so this is how it can be calculated so the distance is simply c which is the speed of light times tau 2 so you have these many meters now, if the transmitted signal is a cosine, what are the relative phase angles between the three multipath components? Okay, so let's imagine that the transmitted signal ST is cosine of 2 pi F. Your F is 980 megahertz. So 980 megahertz means 980 into 10 to the power 6. So 2 pi f, this is your f and then t, okay. So this is your transmitted signal, okay. So what are the relative phase angles between the three multipath components? So just compute these values, a0 times st, uh, your st is this, is a1 times s of t minus tau and a2 times s of t minus tau 2. So all these values are given, so you can just calculate these things, okay. So let me so basically <coughs> so you have st cosine of 2 pi fct and your fc is basically uh, 980 megahertz so you can have rt given by this so <coughs> so you can calculate the different phase okay so let's say this phi 1 is because of this fc t minus tau 1 so my so basically because of this you have phi 1 so phi 1 is nothing but minus of 2 pi fc tau 1 okay and phi 2 is basically minus of 2 pi fc tau 2 so if you calculate phi 1 and phi 2 we will get these many radians and these many radians okay so let's move on uh, so now uh, we have uh, now that we know that there are different uh, problems in a in a channel okay uh, in a wireless channel so <clears throat> now how to how to mitigate those problems so you can 
do coding and error control to uh, minimize the effect of this uh, you know um, channel impairment so you, you can have error detection codes which detects the presence of the error then you can have uh, automatic repeat request protocols ARQ where uh, a block of data with error is is discarded okay and then uh, the transmitter retransmits that block of data okay and then you can have error correction codes or forward error correction codes where uh, it can detect as well as correct the errors okay so <clears throat> so let's uh, look into the error detection process so um, from the transmitter side for a given frame an error detecting code is calculated from the data bits so these are called check bits and that the check bits are appended to the data bits the receiver then separates the incoming frame into data bits and check bits then the receiver calculates the check bits from the received data bits okay using the same function that the transmitter used to calculate the check bits okay and then the receiver compares the calculated check bits against the received check bits okay and then uh, if two of them doesn't match then you can say that there is an error okay so this is what happens so you have data you have k bits of data and then you calculate e which is a function of this data bits and that e gives your check bits okay so you have n minus k check bits and k data bits okay so both of them are appended together to get n bits of a frame and this is transmitted when you receive it let's say this is your received data okay so you calculate based on the received data using the same function as in the transmitter the received check bits okay and then you compare this received check bits or sorry you compare this is the received check bits you compare this calculated check bits in the receiver with the received check bits and if they are the same then you don't have an error if they are not then you have an error so one example of uh, this check bit is a parity check. So parity check bit is appended to a block of data. So you can follow even parity where the added bit ensures that there are even number of ones in the data. Or you can have odd parity where the added bit ensures that there is an odd number of ones. So for example, if you have a seven bit character, so if you, if you do even parity, then your parity bit this one is zero because you already have even number of ones here if you want to follow odd parity then in that case you have to uh, <coughs> sorry you have a one at the end as parity bit because the total number of ones uh, needs to be odd so there were already four ones and now you add another to make it odd so this way you can generate the, the the frames with the last bit being the parity bit uh, either maintaining an even parity or an odd parity now uh, you can have uh, other types of uh, parity check codes so you can have cyclic redundancy check or crc so in this case you have a k bit block and the transmitter generates an n minus k bit frame check sequence and this results in n bits uh, which is exactly divisible by a predetermined number and what the receiver does is divides the incoming frame by that predetermined number and if there is no remainder then it assumes that there is no error if there is a remainder this means that's some of the transmitted bits has been flipped and there is an error and therefore uh, the remainder will mean there is an error no remainder means no error so 
so in case of wireless transmission uh, in, in many scenarios uh, error detection requires retransmission okay so so sometimes uh, detection is inadequate for inadequate for wireless application because you know uh, you if you have just error detection then you detect the error and then you you ask the transmitter to do retransmission and this can result in a large number of retransmission if your if your wireless link has a very high error rate okay so there will be large number of retransmission if you have very high um, like fading very fast uh, uh, changing channel conditions then you, you will have large number of retransmission and this can create long propagation delay okay so this is not enough for or not adequate for wireless transmission systems so therefore you better get a system where you can correct the error also okay so you have you need block error correction codes okay so in this case the transmitter they have a forward error correction encoder which maps each k bit block into an n bit block code word okay note the difference here uh, in case of error detection the the n bit uh, sorry the k bit data had an n minus k bit frame check sequence and the total was n okay here the n bit uh, sorry the k bit data is mapped through a fec encoder and you get an n bit block of uh, frame okay so there is a there is a difference between these two approaches okay so this uh, this n bit will will also contain some redundant bits for uh, for error detection but also for error correction in this case okay and those redundant bits will be will be uh, embedded anywhere within within this n bit frame okay so out of this n k will be data and the remaining n minus k will be error detection and correction uh, bits and they can be hidden anywhere inside this n, n bit uh, world. So in the receiver the incoming signal is demodulated and the block is passed through an FEC decoder. So this is what uh, shows uh, that I was actually explaining. So you have the data k bits and that is passed through an FEC encoder and you get an n bit code word unlike the case of error detection where you are just appending the n minus k here okay within this code word of n bits there will be n minus k bits that can be embedded anywhere within this and uh, which will be helping eventually for uh, detecting and correcting the error so in the receiver you receive this code word and then you go through the FEC decoder which is an inverse function of this encoder and then um, you get back the data okay you can have no error or correctable error or you can have detectable error but not correctable error so in that case you just indicate the error so, so a physics decoder can have uh, different outcomes. So, as you saw in the last slide, so there could be no errors present, okay, uh, which is the case when the code word produced by the decoder matches an original code word. Um, then there could be error which are detected and then they are corrected by the receiver, okay. Uh, there could be errors which are de detected but cannot be corrected and, and then the decoder reports uncorrectable error 
there could be also a scenario where the decoder incorrectly corrects the bit errors okay because the error pattern looks like a different block of data okay so so the decoder i mean this can happen also uh, and then finally the last outcome is that the decoder detects no bit errors though errors are present okay this is also possible so there are few principles of block codes uh, so let's see what are those uh, the first uh, thing is the hamming distance so hamming distance is uh, is defined as the number of different bits okay so for a two n bit binary sequence as you compare so for example if you have v1 which is this and v2 which is this so what are the different bits okay so this let's check from the lsb to msb so this one is same as this this one is different okay this one is same this one is different then this one is same and then this one is different okay so you have three different bits so therefore the hamming distance between v1 and v2 is 3 then comes the concept of redundancy so basically this is the ratio of redundant bits to data bits so in case of a block uh, error correcting code you have n minus k as the number of redundant bits okay so the redundancy is the ratio of this over the data bits which is k so this is your redundancy code rate is the ratio of data bits to total bits so this is k over n and the coding gain is the reduction in the required eb by n0 to achieve a specified per of an error correcting coded system so this is what is showing uh, the concept of coding gain so let's say this is the ber curve without coding and this is the ber curve with rate half coding okay so let's say uh, i want to get uh, i i want to get uh, a prob error uh, probability of error of 10 to the power minus 4 okay so if you draw a line from here so this is the curve with the coding okay so wherever this line meets this curve you find out the required eb by n0 okay and then if you extend this line to to the curve where it is without coding you get another value of eb by n0 so this difference is your coding gain okay because to obtain the same probability of error of 10 minus 4 with coding you are you can have a eb by n0 of let's say 10.5 db okay this value let's say between 10 and 11 is 10.5 and to obtain the same probability of error of 10 minus 4 without coding you need to have almost 13 db so there is a two and half db okay gain that you are obtaining because of coding so this is called coding gain so let's quickly look into the decoding process so so let's imagine that we have these uh, four data blocks four combinations 0 0 0 1 1 0 and 1 1 and for each of them we have a corresponding code word okay so for 0 0 this is the code word for 0 1 this is the code word for 1 0 this and 1 1 this okay so now imagine that you have received this this code word okay uh, so this is not a valid code word okay if you if you match this received code word with one of these then it doesn't matches any of this so therefore there is an error okay so the error is detected so now you want to correct this error okay so let's see what are the hamming distances from this 
received code word to the original code words okay so this is one bit away from this okay uh, two bits away from from this three bits away from this and four bits away from this so basically the most likely scenario is that this particular code word was sent and and uh, because the least Hamming distance is corresponding to this uh, of the received code word okay so the most likely code word is this and you assume that the corresponding data which is 00, zero that was sent but others could have been sent as well albeit much less likely okay so this could have been sent as well and then and, and there could be um, uh, uh, and, the, and the code word for this is let's say this so 0 let's say 0 0 1 1 1 and then if you make two errors in these two positions then you could have received 0 0 1 0 0 as well okay so but the but the chance of this is very less likely okay <coughs> So now if you if, if, if you receive a code word like this, let's say 01100, this is two bits away from uh, the first code word and two bits away from the next and no other codes are closer. Okay. So in this case, it's very hard to decode like which one was transmitted, either this or this. So in this case, you only know bit errors are there, but then you cannot correct the bit errors or you cannot decode. So that scenario is also possible okay so <clears throat> so there is this concept of adaptive equalization uh, in the context of uh, the wireless communication errors and channel impairments so this can be applied to transmission so that carry analog or digital information okay so this is used to combat the inter-symbol interference okay so you saw what is inter-symbol interference so you have a pulse and then you receive the pulse here but then you also and then the next pulse is here which you receive here but then copies of the first pulse can can get over the next pulse and this is called inter-symbol interference. So adaptive equalization is used to combat the effect of inter-symbol interference and this involves gathering dispersed symbol energy back into its original time interval and you can have many techniques like lumped analog circuits or sophisticated digital processing algorithms okay. So this is one linear equalizer circuit. So the basic idea is that you put your unequalized input, okay, whatever is your multipath affected signal, that is your unequalized input, you put it through this circuit, okay. So this circuit has uh, a, uh, a part here which actually adjusts the delays, okay. So you remember that because of your multipath, uh, if you recall the three ray multipath scenario, your received signal RT was A0 ST, which was the direct line of sight component. Then you had A1 S1, uh, sorry, A1 S T minus tau 1 plus A2 S T minus tau 2, right? So this circuit is actually, I imagine that, okay, let's say this was your three ray multipath, imagine that it has four multipaths, okay. So let's imagine another component, which is minus tau three, okay. So now this circuit has a, a part which actually adjusts these delays okay so this is minus tau 1 so let's say all these delays uh, can be compensated using these these blocks okay so these are the delay equalizing blocks denoted by tau okay so all these different 
uh, multipath time dispersions can be adjusted one by one by this part of the circuit and then you have different gains okay a0 a1 and a2 and this part of the circuit these parts can adjust the gains okay so the idea is to adjust the gains and the time delays and then add them together to get back the original signal okay the equalized output okay so whatever be the delays let's say here you have the two pulses and then uh, because of multipath you have this this and let's say this okay so this circuit essentially just recollects all these parts and add together and then you know reinforces the original pulse okay so all this multipath component are are, are are collected together and then and and then combined as a single pulse as it should be through the equalization okay and these uh, a0 a1 a2 a3 and this tau1 tau2 tau3 whatever the gains and the delays are randomly varying okay so this there is an algorithm for this tap and gain adjustment so these are taps and these are gains so all of them can be adjusted so as they vary in the real channel the equalizer can get feedback and and adjust this very precisely so that they can you know counteract these delays and these uh, different gains and then you can have the original equalized output then you can also have the concept of adaptive modulation and coding so uh, based on the changes in your channel uh, your cons your modulation and coding schemes are constantly changing and and you can have this to mitigate the channel impairments and almost get the reverse effect of the channel you can also have different diversity techniques like space diversity frequency diversity and time diversity so that you can select the best signal out of the multiple copies or you can combine them together to get the best possible output okay and then <clears throat> there are many practical ways of actually uh, using diversity so one of them is uh, MIMO multiple input multiple output antennas so you can you can <clears throat> um, exploit the diversity schemes through this type of arrangements okay uh, the modern systems can have uh, massive MIMO where you have large number of antennas uh, but then you have uh, in, in 4G LTE systems you have uh, 4 cross 4 and 8 cross 8 MIMOs okay uh, <clears throat> so different uses of MIMOs are like this so it can it can provide you diversity it can provide you beam forming to get a very highly directional beam in one direction for improved coverage it can have sp space division multiple access uh, uh, and, and improve the capacity okay and it can also have uh, multi-layer transmission for higher data rates in a given bandwidth okay So this is the scheme for MIMO. So in the transmitter side, you have multiple antennas. In the receiver also, you have multiple antennas. So this picture gives a three cross two MIMO because you have three antennas in the transmitter and two at the receiver. Uh, you can have different types of MIMO uh, based on the number of antennas and you can have massive MIMO, uh, which is which is a technology that is used in 5G so you can have more than hundreds of antennas on each side <clears throat> then also there are different channel correction mechanisms to mitigate the effects of the wireless channel uh, 
for example you can have OFDM and spread spectrum so we will study these in details when we will study let's say 3G and 4G systems uh, so I'm just going through them quickly then you can have uh, bandwidth expansion techniques so where a signal can you know uh, you can be can be uh, transmitted over multiple carriers like like that that is called carrier aggregation uh, then you can have frequency reuse you can have millimeter wave so there are many techniques in the physical layer through which you can enhance the quality of wireless transmission so i will stop here today and i will see you in the next video lecture